All right. Now, let's continue with our next sec session, an overview of ethical challenges in dialysis with our expert presenter, Patrick Reiki. Patrick is the director of Dignity and Spiritual Care and chairperson for the Ethics Committee at Parkview Health. He is the author of three books on grief, including How to Talk with Sick, Dying, and Grieving People, When There Are No Magic Words to Say. He leads a team of chaplains who have responded to more than 14,000 patient deaths during his tenure. Patients, Patrick speaks about the end of life, medical ethics, and burnout in the workplace. He was born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's been married to Kristen since the 1900s. <laughs> and they have four opinionated children, aren't they all? When he was five years old, he dreamed of being either a truck driver or a Catholic priest. Wow. <laughs> uh, neither dream has come true yet. Please welcome Patrick. Well, thanks, Becky. I told David um, after that session, went up and talked with him, I said, I might be the only person in the room that's really dissatisfied with how the morning's gone so far. And he said, why is that? I said, because I present next. <laughs> I don't have any walk-up music. I don't look good waving my hand in the air, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but really, what a, what a gift he gave to us this morning. And I think a gift that's going to stick with a, a lot of us, um, maybe for the rest of our careers, the rest of our lives, hearing his perspective on what he's experienced, um, those patient stories, and his story particularly. You know, I've had kids take those athletic physicals, and we assume nothing would be wrong, and just sort of breeze right through it. Um, and to hear that for him, that was a hard stop in his life where everything changed, and then his path and his continuing path, or an evolving path right now, um, was really something that I think we'll all take with us for a very long time. And I realize I don't have my the clicker. Is it up, up, up on top here? Allow me to grab that. I'm not young enough to jump off the front of the stage anymore, so come around to the, uh, the stairs here. All right. Let's see. Is there a switch I should be turning on? Or I'm pressing the big green button. I assume that's supposed to advance the slides, but it's not advancing the slides. Yay, there we go. Now we're good. Well, we're, I know when you saw the agenda today and you saw back-to-back -back ethics presentations, you thought, thank God, that will be amazing. I can't miss that for sure. There's definitely not like ducks about to process through the, the lobby or anything like that. I want to absolutely be glued to my seat and see what these, these presenters have to say about ethics. Um, so what, it really just says something about your character, I think, that you actually came in and sat down after such a, a great session, a beautiful space. Um, and if you didn't know about the ducks, I'm really sorry I said anything, uh, because you might be thinking now to yourself, why am I here if there's about to be ducks in the lobby? Um, so, so I probably should have kept that part quiet, not think about it right, we'll just, we'll just move on. Um, so we are going to talk about ethics just a little bit, and um, ethics, of course, is, is never more interesting than when we go through case studies. So we're going to start um, with a case study about a gentleman named Mike, and we're going to kind of progressively get to more complicated, more involved um, case studies as we go through. I'm going to share with you um, one case study that's uh, rather personal to me uh, towards the end, and you'll see and kind of hear a little bit about that. Um, I'm also going to share with you a case study that uh, is a very old um, ethics consult in my career, one of the, the very first ethics consults that I ever navigated that I still think um, illuminates more about ethics and some of the, the complicated things that come into healthcare and the way that we care for patients, decisions that we make better than just about anything else. So Mike represents that, my, now obviously I've changed Mike's name. Um, this is not our, uh, it's all HIPAA compliant, plus this is just a clip art I got off the internet. So um, I have really no idea what, what this guy's name is. It could be Mike and I could be totally violating his rights by calling him Mike, but Mike represents a patient that was in our Heart Institute at Parkview Health. He came in um, and he was, um, his heart was out of rhythm, he was out of sorts, he was not feeling well. Now you'll notice as I go along I'm not a clinical person, so I'm not going to use some of the big words that you're hearing in some of the other sessions, but he was just not feeling well. 
And for a few days, um, he was, was so out of it that he was hard to communicate with. Um, but we knew his heart was, was out of rhythm, and this was the, the core issue, really, that needed to be addressed. But after a few days, Mike kind of woke up and, and heard a little bit about what's going on. He'd been recommended to have an AICD implanted in his heart. And I'm not going to try to pronounce the word that starts with the letter D there, because I can never uh, quite say it right, but he was recommended to have the AICD placed, and Mike's response was that he did not want to have that AICD placed. In fact, he was one of these patients that when he's ready to be done, he's ready to be done, and so he said, where's my patient belonging bag? Uh, where are my shoes? I'm ready to leave. So let's start with a question. Can he decline the AICD? I see lots of people nodding. Somebody tell me in your words, why can Mike decline the AICD? Raise your hand so I can, I can see who's talking. Just in your words, lots of different ways to say it. Because the patient, bill, the patient bill of rights? Absolutely. Any other way that you would say, why can Mike decline the AICD? Go here and then here. Okay, does he, does he understand what it means? That's an important question here. Go ahead. His body. Yeah, it's his body, it's his choice. Um, so the, the ethics word for that, of course, is patient autonomy. He gets to make decisions about his own body. Now, obviously, if that was all that was going on here, this would not have been an ethics consult. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, but we're going to mix it up just a little bit. Now, this is taken directly from the RHA um, code of ethics. So I, I paid attention to what you, you all are saying, and I think this is excellent. Although my eyes aren't good enough to see the smaller print, so I made it just a little bit bigger. And you can see this is the RHA code of ethics. To preserve the patient's right, right to freedom of expression, healthcare decisions, including refusal, withdrawal of treatment, personal dignity, love that word, and to formulate advanced directives for the best supportive and palliative care. So this is right in your code of ethics um, that Mike certainly can decline this treatment. But if that was all there was, uh, we wouldn't be talking about it today. So are we sure that he can decline? What if a doctor documented, now this is a hospitalized patient, what if a doctor documented that this patient lacks the capacity to make his own decisions? What would you do next? He's saying, remember, he's still vocalizing, I don't want to have the AICD, but you're looking in this chart and you're seeing that a doctor has documented that he does not have capacity to make his own decisions. What would you do next? And there's lots of good answers to this question. Raise your hand for me so I can see you. Go ahead. Call the ethics department. Now, that is not fair, you know? I mean, you've got to do something before you call the ethics department, right? So the doctor that documented that, why did, what was going on, um, what was your assessment, that sort of thing. Good, good. What else might you do? Talk with family. See, so somebody's making decisions, right? Somebody admitted him to the hospital, so let's talk with family. I saw a hand over here. Yep, look for any kind of documentation, healthcare power of attorney, appointed healthcare representative, something along those lines. Anything else? Yeah, the, the real question is, um, has some, maybe some time passed, right? Um, so to, to several of your points, what if he, this declaration was made a few days ago? And maybe Mike seems a little bit more with it today. So we're going to now reassess. In most states, it's going to have to be the physician that reassesses. Does it need to be the physician from Saturday? Let's hope not, because probably she or he has rotated off and they're, they're doing something else now. It could be any doctor, any physician that's, that's uh, providing care of some kind. The attending, a consulting physician can come in and reassess Mike and see if he has capacity to make his own decisions. Let's imagine for a second that Mike still lacks capacity. That physician or team, whoever's going to come in, has said he still really doesn't understand what's going on. Um, he doesn't have the capacity to make his own health care decisions. Um, then who will make the decision about the AICD? Some, there's a few different possibilities, but who might be making the decision now about the AICD? Say again. Family? Sure. How would we, what if he's got a, size, a family the size of David's where he's got a hundred in the room? How will we decide who's going to decide? Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I'm curious, because we've got a cross-section of people from lots of different places, does anyone have a state statute that, that was alluded to here that you don't appreciate? <laughs> So maybe you've got a state statute that kind of goes through, this is who makes decisions, and there's some problem with it. I'd love to hear about that before we go on. Does, is it a problem in Texas? No, it's not a problem. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the definition of child, right? Definition of parent. Yeah. How does the state define parent? How does the state define child or spouse? Absolutely. When I first started in healthcare, Indiana didn't allow same sex marriage. So we'd have a couple that had been together, you know, living as, as spouses for 20 years, 30 years. But because the state statute said that only a legally married spouse could make decisions unless they had completed a, an appointed health care representative form or something similar, all of a sudden they're not actually at the top of the list as they would have probably assumed that they would be, right? So yes, so it's going to be whoever's going to be on that list. So um, appointed health care representative, of course, is going to be near the top. Um, healthcare power of attorney, depending on how your state lays those things out. And then after that, we're usually going to go to that hierarchy of whatever the state has designated. I will say in the state of Indiana for a while, we had a list of four, um, which is a pretty short list of, of surrogate decision makers, and they all had relatively equal authority, meaning that if you had two children, um, and we all know that if you have two children, they are exact opposites, right? Like, that's just automatic. If you have two children, they are opposites, and then you have a third, and they're opposite of the other two somehow as well. So um, in, in the state of Indiana for some time, um, that one child could walk in and say, this is what needs to happen, walk out to go to lunch, the other could walk in and totally change the plan of care. Well, you talk about a nightmare for not only the patient, but the care team as well, right? Because you're switching gears all the time. So let's imagine that Mike lacks capacity and he has an appointed healthcare representative and that's gonna be the decision maker. But let's press it a little further because it's never quite that simple, right? Let's imagine that his appointed healthcare representative is his college bowling buddy, Doug. And who's been sitting at bedside for the past four days is his wife, not Doug's wife, Mike's wife. Mike's wife's been sitting at bedside, involved in caring for her husband, et cetera, et cetera. And now we come to a point where there's a decision to be made about a procedure for the AICD, and you found this paperwork that nominates and appoints Doug as the decision maker for Mike. Who will be making the decision about make Mike's AICD? It's gonna be good old Doug. Now, that, the question is, can anybody reach Doug? Does Doug even remember Mike? You know, we're going to make a phone call. We're going to try to work with, with, uh, with Doug. But he's going to be at the top of that list because of the appointment of that healthcare representative. So now let's imagine, let's change the scenario. And this, is, this more closely matches the scenario that we actually experience. Imagine that Mike does have capacity now. Now we're going to the question um, that was raised earlier. Does he really understand what's going on? Does he understand the risks of declining the AICD? Because if he's been out of it since Saturday and now it's Tuesday, maybe he hasn't been a part of the conversation like everyone else has. And so the question is, does he understand the risks? And what if his wife, who looks very unhappy in this clip art I found on the internet, um, what if his wife, who holds power of attorney and appointed healthcare representative, what if she really thinks he should have the AICD? Because she wants him to live. She wants him to be healthy. She doesn't want him to come back to the hospital. Um, now who's going to make this decision? If he does have capacity, he's educated on the risks, risks the benefits, and the alternatives, um, but his wife holds POA, healthcare representative. Um, in, this, in the actual case, she brought in his living will. She brought in his last will and testament that said that everything went to her in the case of his death. I mean, she had a stack of paperwork like this that she brought to the nurse. In this scenario, who will make the decision about the AICD? Yeah, it's going to be Mike now. Mike, as the patient, he has capacity, and so he's going to make those decisions. But does it mean it's simple? No. <laughs> no, because you've been working with his spouse now for a few days. 
and now the decision maker has changed. And when the decision maker changes, um, things can become much more complicated. All right, so the cases are the interesting point. Always, and Marie and I were talking about this before, and the case, cases are always the interesting part, parts, but you do have to endure some bullet points when we talk about ethics as well. So this will be the, the less interesting part, and then we'll get on to some more case studies. So some generally accepted rules of medical ethics, and hopefully these will sound familiar. We've already started to talk a little bit about autonomy, that we have the ability to rule ourselves. We have the ability to make our own decisions. So can patients make decisions for themselves? Yes, generally we assume that they can make decisions for themselves. Here's a harder question to answer. Can, make, can patients make what we deem to be poor decisions for themselves? Would we feel as though Mike is making a poor decision? We might feel that way. Can he still make the decision? Yes. So one of the major problems I think that we experience, and, and David talked about it a little bit, is that when someone has a diagnosis, especially if they're hospitalized or it's a chronic ongoing condition like kidney disease, we begin to talk to them as though they should make their health their number one priority 100% of the time when they're already um, diagnosed with something that's fairly significant or serious. The truth of the matter is, you and I do not make our health <laughs> our number one priority 100% of the time. You know how I know? You're in here sitting down instead of out, you know, going for a walk in the rain or exercising or something like that. Um, you're going to eat barbecue, you're going to have bourbon, you know, you're going to have some whiskey at some point in the rest of the day. <laughs> I, I see some big nods. Yep, absolutely, I'm going to do that. Um, we, don't, we don't, in general life, we don't make our health our number one priority. And so why do we look at people who are facing some of what David talked about, being very tired, not having the energy, why do we look at them and say, you should make every decision based on how healthy you can possibly be? Now, hopefully we're gonna help them to live a healthy lifestyle that's gonna be meaningful, like what David talked about, but um, it's unfair at times to look at someone who's got a serious diagnosis and say, you should suddenly totally uh, change your priority list and your health should be at the top because we have that right to decide for ourselves. Beneficence and non-maleficence, um, you know, acting in that patient's best interest, not putting any unnecessary burdens on them, and then justice, that so we're providing equity, not just equality, but equity to the patients that we care for. And then when we review cases, we look through these lenses primarily. The first is medical indications. And this might seem like the most basic, but it really does get pretty involved sometimes. So, for example, if I showed up to my primary care physician this week, uh, Dr. Matthew Barb, and I said to Dr. Barb, I'd like to have my tonsils removed. What do you think Dr. Barb's response might be? Why, right? Why do you want to have your tonsils removed? Have you had repeated infections? You know, are they, have they been problematic? Do you have to go on medications repeatedly, et cetera, et cetera? And if my reply to him, as a little bit of an older person, was, no, I just remember when I was a kid, some of my friends had their tonsils out, they put them in, in you know, this formaldehyde or whatever it was, and they put it up on their shelves, and they come, I'd come over to their house and they'd say, look, here's my tonsils that my doctor removed, isn't that cool? That's why I wanna have my tonsils removed. Will he be scheduling me an appointment with an ENT? Will he be scheduling me an appointment with a counselor? <laughs> I, I think that might be the, the most vigorous agreement that I need a counselor in a room that I've ever, ever been in before. Yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna ask me different questions than about my, my tonsils. So that's super straightforward and almost silly and ridiculous, right? But sometimes when a patient's care has become really complicated, we get really sideways on what's actually medically indicated and we stop asking the question or maybe we ask the question once it was medically indicated when we thought about it at that time and then we started doing it and we just never went back to the drawing board to say is this still the right thing to be doing within the scope of treatment the standard scope of treatment at this time you know one of the biggest questions we got and i'm sure many of you had to interact with this question during the pandemic as well was about um, let's say outside of the scope treatments of COVID. 
And so we had patients and families coming in saying, we recognize they're already in ICU level care and they're receiving um, you know, max pressure, max support, that sort of thing, but we think they should receive an aerosolized, nebulized treatment. Um, well, that was outside of the scope of care. It was not medically indicated for those patients at that point in time. But how do you look at a family member, a patient, and say that? How do you tell them this is not something we're gonna do because it's not medically indicated? Um, we have to continue to revisit this lens, not just once, but um, over and over again. The next area, of course, we look at is quality of life. And quality of life is the most slippery part of ethics. Why? Because I look at quality of life through my own lens, my own perspective. So I'll give you a, a couple of examples of how quality of life is um, important for us to get into that individual patient. Just like what David talked about in his experience, what was quality of life to him might be different from somebody else's quality of life. My quality of life would not even include attending a Pitbull concert, let alone um, frontlining for him, because I don't even know who Pitbull is, you know, or <laughs> go to concerts, either one. So like on the Pitbull side, on the concert side, if that's not a part that... That would not be a meaningful quality of life thing for me to say, this is, I want to go on a 42-day you know, world tour. That would not be quality of life for me. But for him, it absolutely was, was like number one on the list at that point in time. So um, when I first started serving at the hospital as a chaplain, we had a young man. Um, we have a lot of Amish uh, families in our community. We had a young man who was a part of an Amish family come in and um, he'd been working with his dad in the, in the uh, family barn, and a um, large piece of machinery fell on him, and it impacted his head significantly. He had significant head trauma. Um, and we knew right away that this, thank you, they're clapping for me out there even, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm not even to the, the whole end of the story yet. Um, but we knew that, you know, he was, he was going to be significantly impacted. So I was in the room with a physician when we're talking with the family about what we've discovered, what's going on, you know, with their, their son. And so we explained the, the cognitive difference that he would experience as he grows older, you know, because of this head injury. And I'm putting myself, I'm putting myself into his shoes because I, you know, I, Chris and I have sons, we have a daughter, and I'm thinking if I was in this room right now, how crushed I would be, how disappointed I would be about what was happening. And the, the dad's uh, question back to us was, how are his arms and legs? And the physician and I kind of exchanged glances and physician said, you know, his arms and legs are, are not impacted. He has, dex he'll probably still have dexterity. Uh, they'll be able to ambulate, walk, that sort of thing. And there was a significant relief for this Amish family because for them that meant that he could still go out into the fields with the family. He could participate in the family functions. He could still be a part of the community in a meaningful way. Now, it wasn't that they did not care about the cognitive impact, but for them, the ability to participate in the community was at least on par with the cognitive ability. Um, where I think for a lot, of, a lot of us, perhaps in the room, that are college educated, you know, medical school, et cetera, et cetera, we might feel as though um, that cognitive ability is maybe more important even if they lack dexterity. So quality of life is different from, certainly from one situation to the next. Patient preferences captures everything from religious beliefs to ethnic beliefs, um, that sort of thing. And then contextual features we'll talk about more with a case upcoming. This is the favorite slide title I've ever had for a slide. Delusional amputee candidate. Um, not because of the situation, but because I just don't think those three words probably go together terribly often. And actually, um, this patient was pretty remarkable. So I want you to think through, from the lenses that we just discussed, this situation. So this patient, an elderly woman, was delusional. She talked to the television. Um, she, in fact, blamed inanimate objects for admitting her to the hospital. Um, and she would talk to those inanimate objects. You're the reason I'm in here. Why'd you put me in the hospital? You know, so she was seeing things that weren't there, you know, that sort of experience. So clearly, she's going to be a person that we're not going to let make her own healthcare decisions because she's, she's delusional. Her um, foot had, been, had become so infected with gangrene that it had to be uh, dealt with. She was getting very sick. She was really facing uh, sepsis, you know, end-of-life diagnosis if she didn't have this gangrenous foot um, amputated. 
And so her sister was the um, decision maker, but her sister lived out of state. You know, the sisters always live out of state. That's always so frustrating. We need sisters to move back so they can be there and come, come to these appointments. The aunts need to move back to, you know, that sort of thing so they can be close by. But the sister was wonderful. She answered the phone. She, was, she listened. You know, she was engaged. She was one of those, those um, decision makers that was very supportive and involved. So in conversation with uh, the patient's sister, our physician in our hospital said, this is what we recommend, that she have this foot amputated. If she does not have the foot amputated, um, we're gonna recommend that she be admitted to hospice um, because she's not gonna survive. We can predict that the sister wanted her, her sister to survive, and so she said, yes, let's do it. Let's amputate her foot, and so surgery was scheduled. Then our orthopedic team came to do the surgery, and they had had her all prepped. They wheeled her down. They're just about to enter into the into the uh, OR, and this delusional patient had a moment of lucidity. And you can predict what she had to say. She said, "I do not want my foot to be amputated. I understand I'm going to die if I don't have it amputated. I do not want to live without my foot. Please do not cut my foot off." So the ortho team um, is not about to go in and cut her foot off right after she said that so clearly and and with lucidity to them. So they turned the bed around, took her back upstairs, and our hospitalist got on the phone with the sister and said, you know, nothing, nothing has really changed. We know your sister doesn't really have capacity to make her own decisions. She's back in the room. She's back to being delusional, that sort of thing. Um, we understand that, you know, she had a moment there, but you're the decision maker, and if you're saying you want to go ahead with the amputation, we're going to do so. So all was agreed. Um, the next day, surgery was planned again. A, a second ortho team came because you can guarantee that first ortho team is not coming back, right? <laughs> When you hear this patient say, please don't come off my foot, and then you see her on your schedule for the next day to cut off her foot, you don't go. Um, And they didn't come. And so it was a different ortho team that shows up. They get her all prepped. They understand the sister's the decision maker. She's signed off. All the consents are taken care of. And so they wheel her down, and just outside the OR, what does this patient do again? She has a moment of lucidity, a second day in a row. Um, no, no other real moments of lucidity documented during her time, and she clearly has a, a, a clear conversation with her ortho team, says, I understand, even expressed understanding of her condition, I understand I might die if I don't get this foot cut off. Is that the ducks coming in? Is that the ring going off? The ducks coming, okay. <laughs> so so the, this is the first time I've ever competed with ducks for attention. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm, I might lose. That's the, that's the really disappointing part, so. Um, but this, this patient, lucidity, uh, again, said, please don't cut off my foot. I understand I might die if, if you don't, but I don't want it to be done. And so that ortho team also, well, we don't have endless ortho teams, right? So we're kind of getting to the end of the road here. She's brought back upstairs, and at this point, um, a decision had to be made. So let's consider from these perspectives. And I, this is a part where I'd like you to chime in with us a little bit. Um, consider the situation from these perspectives. The decision maker, so the sister's perspective, from the perspective of autonomy, who gets to make decisions, um, patients being able to make decisions for themselves, beneficence, what's good in the best interests of this patient, of this patient, and the non-maleficence, what's, an, what's maybe an unnecessary burden that, that could be placed here. And then finally, patient preferences, and this is a, a little bit of a slippery one in this situation to think about what the patient preferences are. So you can think of it through any of those lenses or a different one. Um, What are some of your thoughts, concerns, questions, beliefs, smart aleck remarks um, about this situation at this point before we go on? Go ahead. Because beneficence would be keeping her alive, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. It's kind of the heart of the whole thing, right? And we do have microphones so we can make sure the whole room can hear. So if you don't mind being patient for those. Other thoughts from these perspectives? It's out of the question for her and patient preference. Yeah. We understand it, but she can't make her own decisions. Okay. All right. We got one back here, Michelle. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, though, that moment of uh, this 
lucidity wasn't part of her delusion? Mm, good question. Good question. And how would you? I, I would not be qualified to, to diagnose that. And, and psych is definitely not going with her to the OR to, to assess that, right? Other questions, thoughts? So I want to go off of, of what, you, what you asked. How can we consider patient preferences? Is it ever possible to consider the patient preferences of a patient who is not their own decision maker? What do you think? Anybody, anybody maybe disagree that we could actually consider the patient preferences of a patient who is not her own decision maker? Yeah. So maybe say something about how you would do that or why, why would you say yes, we can consider, because they're not going to be able to sign their own consents, right? But why would we consider the patient preferences of a patient who's not their own decision maker? Because especially with this case where she is at times coherent, mm -hmm. but more than that, you can't force a patient. So if a patient is delusional or not within competency, and they're begging you not to do something, can you, do you, it's wrong to force them. But mm. also, I have another question. Sure. Benevolence, are we doing harm by amputating her leg when she really wants yeah. her leg? That's a good question. So good I, question. I think good. the only question I would have is, was her preferences made known before she was delusional? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer in this case was not really. You know, she had, she'd been delusional upon admission, so, and that's the hard part too, right, is we only see the slice of their life when they're in our care. So maybe if you're in, in a situation where you're seeing them repeatedly, um, you know, in a dialysis sort of situation, you're seeing them, like, like David talked about, and you're, you're building that community, maybe you have some more background, hospitalization less so. Other thoughts? Is the decision making acting in the best interest of the patient? Is the, so is the sister acting in the best interest of the patient? I think most of us, if we had a sister who needed an amputation to live, would probably make a similar decision. She was caring, you know, I think, I think for sure. Yeah. Well, I think I, I want to push back to you on, okay, go ahead, yeah. Is the sister going to be her caregiver after she has the <laughs> That's surgery? A good question. Because a lot of you are involved in ongoing care, right? Chronic care, um, dialysis. There, you sort of have a partner in people who do rehab, right? So the people who do rehab, how's this going to go once she's there? Because it's not just a today decision, right? Yeah. Because sister lives out of state, out of county, out of, out of area. She can't be the caregiver, but yep. she's the decision maker. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I do want to push back on, I think this was a good, good question and good point. How do we know that that moment of lucidity, quote unquote, wasn't a delusion itself? Um, how do we know that that wasn't her true self? How do we know that that wasn't really a, a deep held um, thought or belief or preference that she had that's sort of breaking through for you know, her, uh, her normal delusional capacity? Yeah. Good question. So I'll tell you a little bit about where we landed um, on this particular consult because I think it, it, it really is an interesting one to think through, although not quite as interesting as the next one we're going to talk about. Um, we considered two things here, and, and you hit the nail on the head with the difficulty of what happens afterwards. Um, one, one thing that I think is really interesting is when you have a, a patient who's not their own decision maker but maybe they say the same thing over and over again. So she had said the same thing twice in, in these moments of lucidity at an important juncture, right? Right before she goes into the OR for the surgery. So the fact that she had demonstrated some consistency of her request was meaningful because delusional patients, consistency is not usually their strong suit, right? So the fact that she had been consistent. And then the next question was, what is rehab going to look like for this patient? What if she has similar moments of lucidity after we've amputated her foot? And she looks at those, those occupational therapists, physical therapists, and she says, I did not want them to do this. I would have rather died than be here. Whoa, okay. What do you do now as a therapist as you're caring for this patient? You know, as my friends who work in rehab say, you can't do rehab to a person. You have to do it with a person. So the chances that she was going to be a partner in her own rehab were small. Um, either because of, the, of being delusional or because of this request and not have her foot cut off. 
So our physician wisely took a, a different approach. Again, the sister was caring, was involved. Um, I don't want to paint her in any kind of negative light. So he called her and said, I'm worried about, well, first of all, I'm worried about that maybe we've run out of orthopedic surgery teams. Um, second of all, I'm worried that if we do this, that she really doesn't want to have her foot cut off, like in a, in a true um, patient preferences sense. Um, and so they decided together. So he did not try to convince the sister. She's still the decision maker. But at that point, the sister um, could see that maybe this was going to be an unnecessary burden on her, that in her current state, she was going to have to do rehab without that foot, and that maybe the best uh, way forward for her was hospice. And so that was agreed upon. This patient um, seemed to consistently be uh, satisfied with that transition, transitioned to hospice, and later died. But I think it, it really shows sort of the juncture of a lot of the things that we face on a regular basis. Questions about that one or thoughts about that one before we go on? Yeah, we've got one here and one here. My mom was in the this exact scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, she was having going to have a colostomy, and she said she was a nurse of 40-something years. Oh, wow. Never said, do not ever let me do that because she was a nurse at a uh, sniff. And she said specifically, do not do this to me in the future. My sister, a nurse, my dad could not make the decision to not keep her alive. Yeah. And they made the choice and they had to live with the choice. Yeah. So, and she kept saying afterwards, why didn't you let me go? Yeah. That was my choice. You knew my choice and you couldn't do it. So yeah. it's a hard, it's, yep. it's, it's a challenge, Absolutely. but you've got to listen before you get to the end. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we got one more. I was just wondering, in the beginning of this, did you mention how old that this this? She was elderly. Was? I don't remember her exact age. Okay. She was elderly. And then would that make a difference? So if this was a... 45 year old delusional woman yep. or if this was a 95 year old delusional do we do we change our mind about yeah. what the answer is to this question and the question of do we believe that she'll she'll be not delusional at some point in the future if she's 45 is this a temporary state you know or or is this permanent as well yeah good question go ahead so is there a time limit on lucidity uh, you know, a, a, a expiration date that yeah. you ha or that you go by at all. Yeah, for her it was about ten minutes. I don't know about other patients, but yeah, and it wasn't enough for the doctor to, to reverse and say, you know, I think she has capacity. So, um, yeah, and that's why that's why I carefully use the word lucidity, not capacity, because she patients can wax and wane with capacity, of course, but for her it was just a very momentary sort of thing. So a few ethical crossroads, especially when we think about long-term care, dialysis, that sort of thing, patient autonomy, and medical indications. So just because something's medically indicated, does the patient have to say yes to it? Of course not. Uh, beneficence and maleficence. We know dialysis can provide a great benefit. We just heard one of probably one of the world's best stories about the benefit that dialysis can be. And it's an ongoing story. You know, David, as he said, he, he, his story is still unfolding. So we know it can provide a great benefit. Is it possible that it also can provide an unnecessary burden in the eyes of, you know, looking at it through an ethics lens? Um, another ethical crossroads, patient preferences. You know, some patients uh, may just say, hey, I want to do dialysis no matter what. Even if you're saying as a professional, maybe the time has come to think about whether or not this is appropriate. And then others hate it so much they're ready to stop as soon as they start, right? So how do we honor those preferences? And can we support a patient who might prefer death over dialysis? And how do we gauge whether or not that is a temporary feeling or something that they're going to, going to have as their value system for a long time? Um, the context, what's going on around the patient, family, cost, you know, the, as David talked about, that co-patient, that person that's alongside of them, has to be considered, not primarily, obviously the patient is the primary thing, but needs to be considered alongside of that. Um, should we take these family desires into consideration? And then last but not least, of course, weighing the benefits and the burdens. Um, I think this is a great question. Could, could the burden, we know dialysis is a burden. Is it possible that it's worth it the benefits outweigh the burden one day, and a few days later, things have changed. 
um, to where the, the benefits don't outweigh the burden of dialysis. Just a word about futile care before we go on, because that's sort of what we're dancing around just a little bit is when is care futile? Um, and actually, you know what, I'm going to skip this in favor of time because I know I'll talk about it for too long. Let's go on to our next case study. So this was my first ethics consult, the one I alluded to earlier. Um, this was a patient who was of adult age, female patient, and her mother requested that she have a hysterectomy. And this was a, a phone call I got on a Monday, and surgery was scheduled for Thursday. Do you think surgery should go ahead on Thursday? Why not? There's lot, lots of reasons, but... We're not allowed to ask questions at this point. You have to tell me why you don't want... It. If I answer all your questions, it's not very interesting, you know, so... Yeah, so what's, what's the reason why we've got a hand here? I think, I think without knowing too much information about the client or the, the patient, um, that infringes on their rights. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. The patient. Yeah, she's old enough to make her own decisions, right? And just about, just about any place. That age can vary from municipality to municipality, but at 21 or past, pretty much every place would say. What, are, what other reasons? Well, just because she's old enough to make a decision, can she make a decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Somebody said something over here. Yeah, so we're, the surgery will remove her opportunity to have children. There's something more going on here, too. It may, I see a very strident hand over here. So um, all these things are going on. There's, there's another side to the coin, too. Oh, I was going to say she has the right to refuse. Mm -hmm. Like, do they have all the rights? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Anything else you see before we go in? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like what's going on here with medically, right? I mean, not just socially. We're, we're guessing maybe socially there's a pregnancy concern or something like that, uh, but what's going on medically? So let me add another piece in here. This patient is a, a patient with Down syndrome. So now are you ready for surgery to go ahead on Thursday? No, why not? Okay, so what more information are you looking for? I mean, it would have to be like a legal, um, you know, coming down from legal standpoint where she may have gotten into a lot of issues, with, you know, yeah. so yeah. this is probably to prevent her from possibly having kids as a result of being promiscuous or something yep. like that. Yeah, and is, let, let's say that mother's desire is to keep her from having kids because she might be taken advantage of or something like that. Is that a medical reason for us to do a hysterectomy? No. Is it a social concern? Of course, of course. Um, but it's not a reason for us to provide a medical procedure as, as serious as a hysterectomy. There are a lot of other forms of birth control yes. besides surgery. Yeah, this is the end of the road, right? I mean, there's nothing more significant to prevent pregnancy than a hysterectomy. So, quick question. Can a Down syndrome person have kids? Can they? Yes, yeah. So, I thought you were asking a different question that I didn't have an answer to, <laughs> but yes. What's her level of function? Yeah. And that's really a key question here, right? Because Down syndrome is a, is a spectrum, like a lot of, of diagnoses. Um, and some Down syndrome people live a full functional life where they make their own decisions, they sign their own legal documents, they, they have jobs, they earn money, they are educated, um, they participate as fully as, you know, as, as anybody else in society. And then there's other situations where that's not the case, yeah. So let's move on to the next part. So when I, when I got, this was in the days when um, we faxed a lot more stuff than we do now. So I got a fax with um, a stack of papers about uh, an inch and a half deep about this. Now, I'm medical adjacent now, so I understand a lot of the words, not all of the words that medical people use. At that time, I was new. I was not even medical adjacent um, at that point. So I'm starting to read through all this documentation and see what's going on, and it took me quite some time. But I came, apart one, uh, came across one part that I could understand easily enough, a six-page, single-spaced letter from mom. And mom had addressed the letter to the chairperson of the ethics committee. <laughs> that, that was me. So somehow she knew that the ethics committee was going to have to be involved, and she was ready to plead her case. Because moms are powerful people, aren't they? And she was going to do what she felt was necessary to make sure that what she thought should happen for her daughter actually came to fruition. So in the letter, 
Um, she addressed things that you might expect. She was concerned about pregnancy, um, she, and she also expressed that her daughter had long cycles, that she wasn't able to manage the hygiene very well. Are you ready for surgery to go ahead on Thursday with that new information? No. Why? What, what do you, well, let me, let me change the question. I'll tread into dangerous territory now a little bit. What's your opinion of mom so far? What do you think she's trying to do? Say again. Convenience, okay. Convenience so that, so that what? It's easier. Yep. She's so not going to have to worry about helping her with her personal hygiene, not going to have to worry about maybe raising her grandchild, that sort of thing. Yeah, maybe she's scared that she doesn't want her children then to go through the same struggle. Sure. Yeah. Other thoughts about mom so far? You've got a microphone right behind you there. There also may be a medical concern here. Yeah. I mean, if her daughter has long, painful periods, mm -hmm. she gets anemic, mm -hmm. you know, she, you know, there's a lot of gynecological issues that might be of concern here. Yeah. So, um, you know, it may, mom may have nefarious intent, but yep. she may also just truly be trying to do what's best for her daughter. Absolutely. So we did discover that mom is the court appointed guardian for this patient as we continue to go through the paperwork and learn a little bit more about the situation. Um, and that does, we have one, one up here, go ahead. I was just Second. gonna say six pages is a lot. Like she put a lot of effort <laughs> yeah. into it. Like she, yeah. it's not a flippant She's request. thought it through, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and it does change things a little bit that mom's a court appointed guardian now, right? So court appointed guardian, she will be the one to decide about whatever health care her daughter receives. That doesn't mean that we're going to we're going to go ahead with surgery, but it does mean if there is surgery and there's a consent to sign, mom will be the one that signs it at this point. Um, the next day, my phone rang because apparently mom had called the operator, our health care system, and said she needed to talk with whoever was in charge of the ethics committee. And so very kindly, our operators patched mom through. Um, and my, I picked up my phone and I said, hi, this is Patrick, how may I help you? And um, she was interested in my help. Let's put it that way. <laughs> she, she had a lot to say about what she thought should happen. She rehearsed, um, rehashed a lot of what she'd said in the letter, but she added a couple things. And this is kind of to the point that some of you have mentioned. One was that her daughter goes to a day program that, that's for socializing, for a social interaction. She loves that experience, but when she's there and she um, has her cycle and she has blood on her hands, um, she's not really able to participate in that day program. So there's a, a piece that she's missing there and that she's very sad when she has to miss the day program. Second of all, she talked about the fact that her daughter, because of the long cycles not, and painful cycles, not being able to manage the hygiene, that she developed boils on her genitals. And then last but not least, she said, and sir, my daughter is a thumb sucker and she has blood on her hands and she's often ingesting infected blood uh, into her mouth. Are you ready for surgery to go ahead on Thursday yet? This is the point where we see a little bit of difference, right? We see some of this, and we see a little bit of this. So if no, why not? I mean, she has options. She can hmm. go on uh, um, any kind of medication to stop her, her period, or she can uh, get her... I mean, there's just a lot of yeah. birth control methods out there that she won't have a period, or yeah. she won't have a long period. So, um, and then... Um, depending on how she shows her how to shower, she mm -hmm. can incorporate a lot of routine in her process. So she's, even though she's not on her period, she's just doing the same things yeah. over and over. And once you get into that repetition, she'll be able to take care of herself that way. Yeah. Good. Anybody that's saying yes that wants a microphone in front of them? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on. Um, so some context, because context matters, right? Um, two historical examples of context when we're talking about sexual health decisions or sterilization decisions for people of certain populations. One is Nazi Germany. <laughs> Nazi Germany sterilized people that they thought should not reproduce. Unfortunately, another example is the United States of America. Do we have a good track record with how we treat people from certain populations with their sexual health? No, we don't. 
Um, even with this specific example, the state that we're in, state of Indiana, until the 1970s, it was permissible, it was legal for the state of Indiana to decide to sterilize someone based on diagnosis. So our own local, so not just World War II Nazi Germany, those, you know, that crazy situation, but like local, our state doesn't have a good track record on this. So context does matter, right? Um, and then mom, as she got off the phone, said, if you guys don't figure it out, we'll just take her to Riley, they'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of a threat there, you know, like, hey, you know, we'll just go down the road. And some of my colleagues said, let them, you know, <laughs> let them go down the road and figure it out. And I said, yeah, but we're their healthcare provider. This is the home, their hometown. They're going to have to drive, you know, that if, if they do something like this, wouldn't necessarily be the best for them. But I did call IU Riley and have a conversation with them before we, before we move forward, just to get their perspective on the situation. And then this is really the question that several of you have asked. Why a hysterectomy? Why not the pill? Why not a different form of contraception that's going to keep her from having periods um, but isn't, um, isn't as invasive as a hysterectomy? And the answer to that was actually found in her medical history. So the OB had worked with her since she had gotten her cycle. And so there's good documentation of they put her on the pill and she would put the pill in her mouth and would hide it under her tongue and she'd show mom i have obviously taken the pill and then mom would later find the pill on the kitchen counter or in the trash can or on the floor um, so they'd gone through that for quite some time with mom as you might imagine from what you know about mom she was diligent um, about trying to help her daughter and make sure she made this this process there's a couple other things that they tried over over the course of several years that had been ineffective either at eliminating the symptoms that she was having or just she was not very compliant with them. And then because of being a person with Down syndrome, some of the manufacturers didn't recommend their intervention for uh, this particular patient population. So it really came down in the end um, to two, two um, interventions that would address the concerns, the medical concerns, and one was ablation and the other was a hysterectomy. Um, and so when we talked about ablation, our, our clinician said, um, this is certainly an option, would address the concerns, obviously is gonna prevent pregnancy, which again is a social concern, not a, not a medical indication. Um, and at the end they said, but because she's so young, ablation would probably have to be repeated multiple times for her. So she'd have a, a larger number of smaller surgeries, whereas a hysterectomy obviously is gonna be a one-time surgery, but a much, a much more significant surgery. So at this point, are you, is anyone ready for surgery to go ahead on Thursday? And if, if yes, why? And if no, why? Before we go on. Because I think we're probably a little split at this point. I have a brother who's autistic. And I grew up raising Joel, and it's nothing like this. But I can say it's really easy to put yourself in the shoes of a, we're all caregivers here, to say, mm -hmm. oh, that woman, right? Yep. How dare she, right? That's, that's. But until you walk in those shoes and you're that mother and you're taking care of this child that is sucking her thumbs with period blood on her right. hands and that she's, I, I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but I'm saying, you know, this is, it's a tough thing that mm -hmm. you're dealing with here. And it's really easy to be, a, make a judgment, but I'm just, I would say it's in a whole nother set when you're dealing with possibility of your daughter having a child or somebody taking advantage yeah. of your daughter or I mean so that's just I keep that keeps ringing through my head is thinking yeah. you know it's it's really easy to say this is a how dare she right right you know so yeah and I will be honest so when this case first presented that was what I was saying to myself this what's wrong with this mother? this is about her convenience you know that sort of thing um, let me ask it this way is there a medical indication to do something yeah, yeah, she's got, she's got a medical indication to do something. And then you ask the question, what's the least intervention that will be meaningful? And the OB and, and the patient and the mother and the father together had worked through all of those questions before it actually landed on my desk to, to, to ask the question, what's the least we can do, the least invasive, the least disruptive thing that we can do to address this medical concern? So did they talk about that, like what her life would be at such a young age? I, yeah. I personally was the same way. And it's not, your life changes, believe it or not, when you're young. I mean, yeah, great, no more period, but then comes hormone issues right. and it's yep. a struggle. Yep. So they did talk through it a little bit um, because of time. I'm actually going to 
kind of not answer your question, but it's a great question, and they did they did talk a little bit about it. <laughs> so, are you ready to hear what we what we recommended? Okay, and I'm not asking you to agree with what we recommended. This is why it's an ethics consult, right? So we did um, come to a resolution where we actually had a vote with our committee, and we said we recommend because something needs to be done for her. And because of all the other medical interventions had been considered and, and either ruled out or were on par with what she would be experiencing with a hysterectomy, um, that we did recommend that surgery could go ahead on Thursday. We took a second vote, though, that I think was maybe more important than the first, and that was to say that that decision did not set any precedent for any other patient, any other scope of treatment, any other mother's request at any point in time in the future. So we had to go through every little part of this scenario to get to that resolution, and that did not necessarily mean, you know, when somebody else comes in with a similar scenario that we were going to make the same approval. But I think this story illuminates so many different pieces of ethics, and I'd like to talk more about it, but I want to move on to our final case study. Let's consider DNR and dialysis. So imagine um, this patient is a 71-year-old male with a history of, uh, you know, of kidney cancer, had one of those kidneys removed, diabetes, um, kind of in the early stages of CHF, had had some other heart problems, but those were under control and had been dealt with. A little bit about the social, um, sort of the personality of this patient. He's a Cubs fan, so you know he's a loyal, faithful human being because he's a Cubs fan. <laughs> you have to be loyal to, to maintain with the Cubs. Um, just one step below Browns fans. Browns fans have to be a, at, the, at the very height of loyal people um, in the world. Um, he comes from a large family. He has a large family, seven children, um, lots of grandchildren from a small town in Indiana. Um, he's basically ret retired, but he's still spending a little bit of time working local sports events. And by local sports events, I mean middle school track meets, um, high school basketball games, you know, that sort of thing. And then he's at one of these events, and he's um, working as the, the uh, person with the starter's pistol for a middle school track meet. He fires the pistol, and he falls over with cardiac arrest. This patient, given what I've just described to you, what's ethical to do for this patient? Is CPR appropriate for him? Would you like me to go back? So look at his, his history, his life. Is CPR ethical for him. No, no paperwork in place, so no out-of-hospital DNR, nothing like that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so ethical to do CPR, and what if he, after that, with the diagnoses that he has previously, um, diabetes, uh, early stage congestive heart failure, um, some of these things going on, would he be a good candidate, from what you know, would he be a good candidate for dialysis? Say again. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. I heard a long sentence, but yes was your answer. Gotcha. So yeah, he's a, he's a candidate for dialysis. So it's ethical, it's medically appropriate to do CPR yeah. on this patient, medically appropriate certainly for dialysis. But he was in public being a starter. How do the people around him know that he's DNR? Yeah, so he wasn't DNR at, at this point. Oh, he wasn't? Yeah, he wasn't, absolutely, yeah. So let's fast forward a few years down the road. Now the gentleman is 75 years old. Now his, his congestive heart failure has progressed significantly. He's at the end stage for that. Um, his diabetes is very severe. His diet is extremely controlled and limited between the diabetes and the CHF. Um, he's been on in-home dialysis for a long time um, with mixed experiences there. Um, he really can't get up and going anymore. He can't travel. He can't go see his grandchildren that are um, out of town. He's been falling. His uh, wife, who's similar in age at home, is having a hard time helping him even to the bathroom and back. Uh, he's been in the hospital over and over, often taken emergently by ambulance. Um, he has a, a diagnosis of lymphoma. His skin is breaking down pretty significantly, um, and the family's kind of struggling to provide care. Um, he gets to this, the point where he's been referred to hospice, but the family declined because he can't continue to do dialysis when he goes on hospice for, their, for their, the services that are available to them in their small town. 
And then on a Thursday, as this gentleman, again, who's a Cubs fan, is um, in his, in his uh, recliner um, watching the Cubs play. He sees this play. Does anyone recognize this play before I even press play? This is a, a fairly um, recognized play. No, no real faithful Cubs fans in the room, okay. All right, this is from, from a few years ago. So that's Javi Baez. He hits it to third. Ground roll double, or, you know, typical ground. He's, he's grounding out to third. But this, the first baseman's not on the base, so he has to chase him down. While he chases him down, the guy from third scores. And he's like, oh, now I'm just going to go ahead and get out at first base. Oh, no, they overthrow the base. And so now he's turning. You have got to be kidding me. Javi Baez. They throw it up past him again. You're invisible. El Mago indeed. That is unbelievable. That is incredible. <laughs> so he sees this play. Had worked as a, as a coach for softball, for baseball for years in a small town. Was an umpire for many of these things. So seeing a play come out like this was, was hilarious to him, was fascinating, and it involved one of his favorite players, Javi Baez. So he gets on the phone. And he talks with a couple of his children about the Cubs game and how funny that was. And they relive the whole thing together that Friday. But that night, his breaths become uh, changed. And he's experiencing agonal breathing. And his heart, that night, um, about 24 hours after that play happened, and after he had a conversation with his kids about how crazy the Javi Baez play was, his heart stops. In fact, his heart stopped about 30 minutes after my wife arrived. Is it ethical at this point to do CPR for this patient? He's in a different place than he was a few years ago, right? And so when my mother-in-law, standing over my father-in-law, looked at my wife, who's here with us today, and said, should we call 911? Should we do CPR? And they decided together as a family, no. That was the right thing that day. Four years before, for a gentleman who's still going out to middle school track meets, dialysis, CPR, all the medical interventions were appropriate. A few years down the road, things had changed. This was the last trip that my father-in-law took. He was on dialysis for a year or two before this picture was taken. Uh, we flew him and, and my mother-in-law to Orlando to be with us and our four kiddos to take in Disney um, one last time. He had taken his seven kiddos to Disney a couple times when they were younger. It was a pain in the ass taking somebody on dialysis <laughs> to Disney World. Was it worth it? Of course. Of course. Of course. So the crossroads for my father-in-law, patient autonomy. What does he want? Does he want to be on hospice? Does he want to continue to receive dialysis at the end of his life? What about his quality of life? Could he have dialysis so that he's just more clear-minded, not to try to resolve all the things going on with him physically? What about the benefits and the burdens? It benefits him to have dialysis because it keeps him going, um, but it's also a burden. Should he have had dialysis the night before he died? Was that good or was that bad? Beneficence versus maleficence. Medical indications, what's medically appropriate for him at that point. Um, CPR and dialysis for him at that point were no longer medically appropriate. So if, if this has been helpful to you at all today or a good conversation, if you don't mind, if you've got your phone with you, um, if you, and I guarantee this isn't like spyware or something like that that I'm putting onto your device. Uh, but if you don't mind, for, I know you're going to do the formal reviews, and that's, that's where you're going to get. I give you no CEs for doing, doing this review. I, I apologize. But this will help me to get better um, because I think these conversations and the conversation Maria is going to lead us through are so important. Um, and we need to continue this conversation. So that review will take you just 
probably not even two minutes to complete. Tell me a little bit about your perception and what I could do better through this talk. I'm going to be back with you later this afternoon at 4. We're going to go through a burnout talk then, um, maybe related to some of the things that we've talked about through the, the course of the day already. Uh, but if it, this has been helpful, if you've enjoyed this, it's been inspiring or helpful at all, I'd love for you to leave that quick review. And I'll give you just a second while I take a drink of water before we, we wrap up and I finally get out of the way for Maria. Oop, keep pushing the wrong button. So when we're at a crossroads, finally to wrap up, the magic is really to listen. And David told us listening is really um, the only magic way forward. Hearing, you know, from our situations today, we talked about Mike, we talked about this young woman who's facing, uh, facing a hysterectomy, talked about this delusional patient, talked about my father-in-law. Really, there was no ethical expertise displayed in any of this, but what was displayed was listening. So thank you guys, and I'll see you back in a little while.